Hey everyone, this is MedTube channel and I'm happy to present to you another video on how to read an abdominal radiograph easily. But first, let's have a quick introduction which is the same one which you have seen in the chest radiograph video. Now x-rays are the radiations, whereas the images that we see are called the radiographs. Therefore, the correct naming is to say abdominal radiographs and not abdominal x-rays. There are four main tissue densities with both being the densiest and it looks white on radiographs whereas gas is the least dense and it looks black on radiographs. Everything white is called radiopaque whereas everything black is called radiolucent in radiology. Please remember that x-rays are just a modality of investigation so we must always take into consideration the clinical presentation and the physical examination of the patient. Alright, so now let's move to the outline on how to read an abdominal radiograph. So they are exactly the same outline as used in chest radiographs, except for the last point which was looking at previous radiographs, as abdominal radiographs are not done as routinely as chest radiographs. And that's because one abdominal radiograph is equivalent to the radiation exposure dose of approximately 35 chest radiographs. Perfect, so now let's start with number one, the patient details. And the patient details were interested in the full name, the age of the patient, the gender, the hospital number, and the date and the time the radiograph was taken. And then the next step is to check the projection of the abdominal radiograph. And in general, we have two main projections. We have an AP projection, which is the standard projection, and it's done in the supine position. This is in contrast to the chest radiograph, where the PA projection was the standard one, and it was in the standing position. We have one subtype of AB projection which is called KUB, which stands for kidneys, ureters, and bladder, as this abdominal radiograph is done to visualize the urinary system. However, because of the air containing bowel standing in front of the kidneys, it is usually done with an IV contrast in a procedure called IV urogram or IV pyelogram. However, this is not routinely done anymore and it has been largely replaced by the CT. Urography. The second projection is lateral projection and we have two main types. The first is the left lateral decubitus position which is suitable for unstable patients who are not able to stand up as in cases of suspected perforation. And the idea is that when you put the patient on the lateral side, the free air will ascend and appear on the top of the radiograph and the reason we put the patient on the left side so that the air is not confused with the gastric bubble on the left side but rather the air will be against the solid liver so it could be easily identified or the patient could be in a supine position and then it would be called lateral shoot through and here we have an example of an AP supine position and this is the standard projection which you will usually see in abdominal radiographs and here we have a lateral projection in the left lateral decubitus position. So you can see here that the liver is upwards. So you can see this dense homogeneous shadow. This is the liver because the patient is on the left side. And you can see here a marker saying right because the right side of the patient is on the top of the picture here. Great, now we have just finished the patient details and the projection. And now moving to assessment of the technical quality of the radiograph. And the technical quality here is easier than in the chest radiographs as we simply check for two things. The first one is the image field in which it must include the hemidiaphragms down to the symphysis pupus. Except when we are taking a KUB, then the hemidiaphragms are not necessarily included, but instead the top of the picture will be approximately at the superior poles of the kidneys. The second thing is the penetration in which we must see the spinous processes through the vertebral bodies so that the radiographs is adequately penetrated. Now here we have an AP supine abdominal radiograph, the same one which we have just seen previously, and we can see that the hemidiaphragms were not included in this radiograph, therefore this is actually a technically inadequate radiograph, whereas the symphysis pubis and the hernial orifices are included. Fantastic, now we have just finished the technical quality, and now moving to the obvious abnormalities in abdominal radiographs. For example, a pneumoperitoneum, or an air fluid level, or a sigmoid volvulus, or even masses, and other things, all of those are usually obvious from the first look on the radiograph. However, in abdominal radiographs, usually the findings are subtle, therefore it is very, very essential to go through the systematic review, which we will be paying special attention in this video. 
Here we have an erect AP abdominal radiograph showing dilated small bowel because of the valvulae conniventis and we can see multiple air fluid levels indicating small bowel obstruction. So such a finding would be usually obvious from the first look. Here we have an example on sigmoid volvulus and you can see the coffee bean sign of the sigmoid column. But just like what I've said previously, the systematic review is very essential on abdominal radiographs as findings are usually subtle. So the first thing we check for is gases, and gases stands for the bowels and the free gas in the peritoneum, known as the pneumoperitoneum. So we start by identifying the small and the large bowel, and then by measuring the diameter of the bowel, and then we measure the bowel wall thickness, and we finally look at the pneumoperitoneum signs, as we will be explaining shortly. So here we have an example of small bowel, and you can see that the small bowel is central, unlike the large bowel, which is more peripheral. And the small bowel has mucosal folds, known as valvulae conniventis, which appear as stack of coins all the way through the diameter of the small bowel. And this is very important to differentiate the small bowel from the large bowel, however it is not always visible. And the diameter is normally less than 3 centimeters for the small bowel, therefore this one is certainly enlarged as it is almost 5.4 centimeters. So this is, so there is small bowel dilatation on this abdominal radiograph. Here we have an example of large bowel and you can see that the mucosal folds do not traverse the whole diameter of the large bowel. So those folds are called hostra. However, those mucosal folds are not always diagnostic. Regarding the diameter, the diameter of the large bowel is normally less than 6 centimeters, except for the cecum, which is normally less than 9 centimeters. And please also note the peripheral location of the large bowel here. And here we have the fecal material in the large bowel, so those bowels are definitely the large bowel because the feces are never found in the small bowel nor in the stomach. And now looking for the pneumoperitoneum signs. Now take this rule of thumb. Whenever you suspect a viscous perforation, the best next step is to do an erect PA chest radiograph because the free air under the diaphragm is best visible on the erect chest radiograph, not the abdominal one. And we can see here the free air under the diaphragm, and this is known as the crescent sign, indicating a pneumoperitoneum. And the blue arrows here are simply indicating the normal position of the splenic flexure of the colon. Here we have another sign of the pneumoperitoneum, and this is known as the double wall sign, or regular sign. And what it means is that there is gas surrounding the bowel wall on both sides, the intraluminal side and the extraluminal side. Now normally there is only intraluminal gas making the bowel wall only visible from one side. As in this previous picture for example, we can see that only the intraluminal side has the gas. But when there is also extraluminal gas, the bowel wall will be visible from both sides. And this is known as double wall sign or regular sign. And there are other signs of the pneumoperitoneum not shown here as the hyperlucency of the liver, the triangular lucencies, and the visualization of the falciform ligament. Here we have an example on a supine AP abdominal radiograph showing the free air in the central of the abdomen and that's because the patient is supine. And we can also note in this picture the surgical staples, so this patient must have had a laparotomy. And then moving to the second part of the systematic review, which is looking at the organs, such as the size of the liver, the spleen, and the kidneys, and even checking for aortic aneurysms. However, please note that the best visualization of those organs is done through ultrasound or through CT scans. And then the third thing we check for on the systematic review is the stones, and that includes all kinds of stones, such as gallstones, renal, ureteric, bladder calculi, phleboliths, which are venous calcifications, and finally looking for pancreatic calcifications, as in chronic calcifying pancreatitis. Please note that the gallstones are usually radiolucent and therefore not visible on abdominal radiographs, whereas most of the urinary system stones are radio-opaque and therefore visible on the abdominal radiographs. Here we have a KUB showing the renal stones, so you can see those small opacities on the right side and on the left side, and you can see that the right side is slightly lower because the right kidney is lower. And you can also see some stones down here below indicated by the white arrows and those are called phleboliths which are venous calcifications. Here we have another example of phleboliths and you can see multiple calcifications 
in the veins and the pelvis. But if I ask you the following question, how can we differentiate whether those stones are actually in the ureter or in the urethrovesical junction or are those phleboliths? And the answer is, the phleboliths have a central lucency surrounded by calcification. And that's because the calcification is in the walls of the veins. This is in contrast to the calcification of the erythric stones, such as on this radiograph, I can see that the lucency is more peripheral and the opacity is more central. And this is known as a soft tissue rim sign. Here we have another radiograph showing multiple tiny calcifications and this patient had a chronic calcifying pancreatitis. Fantastic, so we have just finished the gases, the organs, and the stones. And now moving to the bones, such as the spine, pelvis, the femoral joints, the proximal femurs, and even the ribs. And we look for all bones pathologies, such as osteoporosis, sclerosis, scoliosis, and even metastatic deposits. And finally, we conclude by looking at foreign bodies, such as lines, surgical trains, and clips. Here on this radiograph, we can see multiple sclerotic lesions which are round and will circumscribe such as here. And this patient actually had a prostate cancer and we can see the multiple metastatic sclerotic deposits even in the lumbar spine here. And the reason they are sclerotic is that because the metastatic lesions in prostate cancer are osteoblastic. That will be all for the outline and we finalize of course by summarizing our findings and suggesting an appropriate management plan. I really hope that this video has been as easy as possible. Thank you very much for watching and please look at my next video on how to read an abdominal radiograph in less than one minute by applying all of the previous steps on one abdominal radiograph. Thank you very much and I wish you a great day ahead.